Hello and welcome to this film which is all about electrolysis but this time instead of dealing with molten substances we're going to be dealing with aqueous substances so hopefully by the end of this film you'll see that adding water to your electrolyte can introduce or does introduce hydrogen and hydroxide ions and also we'll start to see that depending on what you make your electrodes out of um, you'll actually form different products Okay. And what we'll need to be able to do is to use the observations that we make during electrolysis to decide what reactions have taken place and write half equations. Right. So rather than predicting what reactions will take place and saying what you will see, which would actually be quite a lot harder, um, all you've got to do is to take the observations that you make and explain them. Okay, so... First of all, let's have a look at what's actually going to be new in our electrolytic cell. Okay, Whereas before, we just melted an ionic solid and ended up with some positive and negative ions that were floating around in the solution. This time, because we're adding water, right? because we're dissolving our ionic solid in water to make it conduct, because remember that if I take an ionic solid and dissolve it in water, the ions can move around just like they would be able to if it was molten. Okay. We need to remember that water is something called a weak electrolyte. That is to say it breaks up into ions, but its ionization isn't complete. Not many molecules do this. But as soon as you add water here, you are going to be introducing these two ions to your electrolyte. You're going to have hydrogen ions and you're going to have hydroxide ions. So now in addition to these positive and negative ions, you're also going to have H plus ions and you're going to have OH minus ions. And these act just like the other ions in that the negatives go to the positive electrode and the positives will go to the negative electrode. Okay, So deciding which of these two positive ions is going to gain electrons and be reduced is quite a difficult thing to do. But if you know what has been formed or if you can use the observations made at this electrode to decide what has been formed, then you can decide which of those ions has been reduced. Likewise, it's not a simple thing based on year 11 knowledge to decide whether your negative ion or your hydroxide ion is going to lose electrons at the positive electrode. Okay, But we don't have to do that. We just have to look at the observations and decide which one of them has done so. Okay, now how we're going to do that will become clear over the next couple of slides. Um, but for now, let's just also mention that the other thing that is new or different here is that the electrodes that we're using, what they're made of will actually influence what products will form when we do the electrolysis. And again, you don't have to predict what products will form based on the electrodes that you've used, but you do have to look at the results of your experiment and decide what products have formed. Okay, So it's not the really difficult type of problem based on year 11 material. It's not the really difficult type of problem that says, right, okay, if I use these electrodes and this solution, what would I form? Okay, In year 11, we just have to say, right, these are the observations we made. What products must we have made and what were the reactions occurring? Okay. As before, oxidation will still be happening at the anode, that's always true, and reduction will always be happening at the cathode. Okay, so that hasn't changed. Right, moving on. Let's have a look at an actual example of this, right? Now, as I've just said, the choice of electrodes is important. Okay, we don't have to look at them and decide what will form, but it's just important to be aware that depending on what electrodes I use, I'm going to get different products. Now this particular electrolytic cell uses inert electrodes, graphite electrodes that won't react, they won't become oxidized or reduced themselves. Okay. The sort of question that you'd have to deal with here would be saying, right, okay, we did this electrolysis experiment and we found that a uh, salmon pink solid was deposited on the negative electrode and we saw bubbles of colourless gas forming at the positive electrode. Um, and when we collected this gas, we found that it relit a glowing splint. Okay, So they're the observations that we might be presented with. What we've got to try and do is decide what must have gone on. 
OK, let's have a look as usual at what's in our electrolyte. Now we're doing it in aqueous solutions. So that means we've added water and we're going to have water's ions. OK, so as well as the copper 2 plus and the sulfate ions that we've got in the solution, we've also got H plus and OH minus. So our copper 2 plus and our H plus ions are going to be attracted to the negative electrode. OK? They're going to want to gain electrons, so they're going to want to be reduced. OK? We don't have to decide, without the guidance of observations, which one of them would gain electrons. But because we know that a salmon pink solid formed at that electrode, we know that copper must have been forming. OK? Because if hydrogen had gained electrons, we'd have got bubbles of hydrogen gas, which is colourless. OK? So we'd have had bubbles of a colourless gas. But we know that we got a salmon pink solid forming, so we know that the copper ions must have been gaining electrons. I'm not going to spend too much time on the half equations now, because we should be quite good at this by now. So the half equation at the cathode, or the reduction that took place, must have been copper ions gaining electrons and turning into copper, and that explains our salmon pink solid. Now, at the anode, where oxidation happens, right, we produced bubbles of a colourless gas that relit a glowing splint. This gas is oxygen, okay? As soon as we know that this gas relights a glowing splint, we know we've got oxygen. So oxygen must have formed, okay? Now, oxygen can't form from a sulphate ion. And in fact, if you look up on your data sheet, you'll see that there is this half equation with 4OH- minus turning into 2H2O and O2 and 4 electrons. Okay, So you could combine these two half equations to make an overall equation. I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to take it for granted that we know how to do that by now. Okay, But by using this observation, we decided that oxygen formed and therefore the sulfate ion wasn't losing electrons, but the hydroxide ion was giving up electrons and forming oxygen. And this half equation... I wouldn't have to be able to figure that one out because it's on my data sheet. I'll just go ahead and look it up. OK. Now, same electrolyte, aqueous copper sulfate. So same ions present, copper 2 plus and SO4 2 minus and um, <clears throat> H plus and OH minus from the water. OK, but this time I'm using copper electrodes. Now, copper itself can react in a redox equation. Copper can lose electrons. Okay, and if copper loses electrons, it's going to become a copper 2 plus ion, and it's going to give up those two electrons. Okay, this is an oxidation process. So as well as potentially our sulfate ion or our hydroxide ion losing, electro losing electrons at the anode, we could also have copper losing electrons at the anode. Reduction at the cathode. We've got two possible ions that might like to gain electrons, copper 2 plus and hydrogen. Okay. Now, what observations do we make when we do this experiment? Okay. So now, again, don't have to predict what would I make if this was the experiment. We just have to say, right, okay, let's read the question carefully and see what we found out. Okay, At the negative electrode we find that we get a salmon pink solid forming on the electrode. Okay, And the electrode gains mass. Okay, But what we find is at the positive electrode that there's a kind of gradual dissolving of this electrode and that it's losing mass. No bubbles of colourless gas forming this time. Okay, so hydrogen isn't forming and oxygen isn't forming. Okay, what could be happening at the negative electrode? Well, the negative electrode attracts positive ions, and we've got a salmon pink solid forming. So, copper ions are gaining electrons, that's a reduction process. Copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons turning into copper. So, I've used the fact that I know a salmon pink solid formed, decided that copper must have been made. What could it have been made from something that gained electrons from this negative electrode? That could be a copper ion. So there's the half equation for that. Oxidation at the anode. What could have lost electrons that would have caused this electrode 
to seem to lose mass or to dissolve? Well, the electrodes made of copper. So if the copper was turning into copper ions and giving up electrons, that would explain why the copper is dissolving because it's turning into aqueous ions. Okay? So again, notice I've used different electrodes, so I'm getting different results to the last experiment, but I'm being given the observations and I'm just figuring out what must have been going on at the electrodes. Okay, moving on to our final example. This is the electrolysis of dilute sulfuric acid, which you may well see in class in something called the Hoffman voltameter. Um, but in case you don't, it doesn't really matter. What we're being shown in this diagram here is that we've got water and an electrolyte. For example, an acid solution, sulfuric acid in this case. So our electrolyte has H plus ions from the sulfuric acid. It's got sulfate ions from the sulfuric acid. It's got H plus ions from the water. And it's got OH minus ions from the uh, water as well. Sorry. Right. Now, as usual, oxidation at the anode, reduction at the cathode. What might have been going on? Well, what were the observations, first of all? Well, we got bubbles of colorless gas at both electrodes. These are platinum electrodes, which means they're inert. They're not being oxidized or reduced themselves. So remember how in the last experiment, the copper, one of the copper electrodes actually got oxidized itself and it started to dissolve. Platinum is an inert, unreactive material that won't get reduced or oxidized okay and if we did it with a different if we use different materials for these electrodes we'd get different results but we're not worried about that because the results are what they were okay we got bubbles of colorless gas at both electrodes we actually found that there was twice as much gas forming in this as in this tube okay um, <clears throat> We might be told, in, in case we weren't actually shown on the diagram that these were hydrogen and oxygen, that this gas burnt with a squeaky pop and that this one relit a glowing splint. So what might have been going on? Positive electrode, that is the one that attracts negative ions. They're the ones that like to lose electrons, so it's the anode. Okay, Which ions might come here and lose electrons? Well, sulfate or hydroxide. We know that we had a bubble, we had bubbles of a colorless gas that relit a glowing splint, so oxygen must have formed. You can't form oxygen from that, but you can take four OH minus ions and turn them into two water molecules and oxygen and four electrons. Remember that equation is on your data sheet, okay? So don't try and remember it. I mean you might might end up remembering it, but it's not one you have to learn. What's being reduced at the cathode? Well, the only choice is H plus ions. So two H plus ions come along and they gain two electrons and they turn into hydrogen gas. And that accounts for our bubbles of colorless gas that burn with a squeaky pop. Now, let's see what we've actually got going here. If I combine these two half equations, right, I'm going to have four OH minus plus two H plus, sorry, plus 4H+, plus, because I've doubled this one, right? They're going to form O2 and 2H2O and 2H2, okay? Because I've doubled this half equation. Now, if you look carefully at this equation, it shows us that I'm getting one mole of oxygen for every two moles of hydrogen. And that explains why the volumes of the gas gases that we collect are what they are. That's why we get twice as much hydrogen as we do of oxygen. Because if they're at the same temperature and pressure, then the volume is proportional to the number of moles that we form. Okay? So, that's it for the examples. As we said at the start, by the end of this film, hopefully you would see how adding water caused there to be hydrogen and hydroxide ions to be present, and the fact that using different electrodes can give you different products. What we've been practicing is actually looking at observations we've been given in a question and using those observations to decide what products must have been formed and then writing half equations to show how those products formed from the electrolytes that we had or indeed in some cases from the electrodes that we used. Quite a lot more difficult, I suppose, than the electrolysis of, electrolysis of molten substances because there's a lot more stuff to consider.
please feel free to come and ask me some questions if any of it didn't make any sense. And if you want to post some comments on YouTube, that would be absolutely fantastic because, as usual, people can then see the answers to your questions when they watch the films.